So this is the first of three sessions. Each group have three sessions each. And this part of the session introduces the context, which is about storytelling and the relationship between children's literature and drama and how those two spheres, if you like, cross over. I carry out what I call a risk assessment, which is basically to ascertain how fearful students are in this initial stage. So at this point, then I ask the students to stack their chairs, move their bags, take off coats, and stand in a circle, which can sometimes take a little while. And as you can see, their body language is, is at this point often quite inhibited. I am passing around a pair of, of tiny little red shoes. There's some Chinese music playing. There's some Chinese artefacts placed around the room. And there's a piece of Chinese clothing which will come to shortly on the floor. And I explain to them then that they'll be taking part in this story um, by literally stepping forward from the circle and taking on roles from the story. And the only person that will actually wear a costume will be the person who's playing the protagonist, whose name is Zhao Xiao or the Little Princess. Zhao Xiao's favourite toy is a kite made out of sticks and paper. And every morning, when the wind blew from the east, Zhao Xiao would play with her this technique is called the story wash. It's very common in drama education circles as a way of uh, engaging in active storytelling. Usually with children, you've got loads of volunteers, but often working with undergraduates, you find the opposite is the case, that they are hesitant about initially taking part and therefore you have to use a bit of brute force to get them up and doing. <laughs> What I've asked them to do is to retell the story in ten words or phrases. So they're summarising the plot in groups. We're then using a kind of much more performative technique and I'm also trying to introduce them to this idea of Eastern methods of performance as opposed to Western traditions of performance which, which are fundamentally quite different. So what I ask them to do is create for each of the, the words or phrases they've used to create a gesture. The next stage of the, the lesson introduces a method of, a pedagogical method if you like, called Mantle of the Expert. I mentioned it very briefly. The actual storybook says that these evil wrongdoers tell the people that the emperor is dead. So I've omitted that bit. And I just let them assume that he's been taken away and locked up and kidnapped. But I go back to this part of the story to look at perhaps this part of the story from a different perspective. And what I do is I give the students roles to play, each one of the four groups represents one of, the, one of the four sons of the emperor. And each of the four sons has been given a, a section of China to rule over on behalf of the emperor. And so in this section, using this concept of mantle of the expert, the students are asked to look at some images and use this as a very, very quick research exercise into what they think might be the issues that are happening in their particular region or part of the continent. So the students get a short amount of time to look at these images and to come up with an argument that they will present to the emperor as to why whatever rumours have been flying around are in fact merely that, just rumours. They're then asked to meet the emperor. So I use a costume signifier, which is a, which is a hat with a false plait, and I've got some Chinese money. The students then put forward their argument using the images to support as evidence. It's a, it's a literary device, it's something that children will be taught at some point, but often it's taught through, merely through writing as opposed to through debate, discussion, and through the oral tradition of 
arguing, the kind of forensic um, way of looking at arguments. So the session ends as the emperor um, thanks them for their contribution and suggests that they all have a celebration. And then I sort of leave the role of the emperor and go back into role as the facilitator. What I often find really interesting um, at this stage is that the student's demeanour has changed and their body language is illustrative of this, if nothing else, in that they, they just appear more confident. 